Hi everyone, it's Angel Noxus. I'm here with Robert M. Place, and we are talking today about tarot and neoplatonism, correct? Correct. Okay, and we're using your tarot deck, the seven, uh, right. Sevenfold Mystery? Right, this is the tarot of the Sevenfold Mystery. Do you, do you know what, how would you define neoplatonism? Neoplatonism, uh, well, it's more of like a post uh, commentary, like a, like a name described to them, because when the people who were doing Neoplatonism back then, they just saw themselves as Platonists. They didn't call Correct. themselves. Correct. So it's, it's like a period after Plato. Uh, they were um, uh, following his teachings, but it was revised and updated. So it kind of went off the track a little bit from Plato originally. Well, I could, instead of off the track, I would say synthesized with other mystical traditions. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's a little more positive. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so uh, yeah, so ba but basically Plato was mystical in the first place. So it's not so. See what happened is, in the eighteen hundreds, German uh, historians uh, coined the, the term uh, Neoplatonism to distinguish it from Platonism, which they felt was more logical and less full of mumbo jumbo. You know? mm -hmm. So the thing is, uh, but Plato was full of mumbo jumbo already. So yeah, and it's like and they would they would, they reformed Plato into something that really wasn't him. Yeah. So it's, and as you said, nobody nobody ever would have called themselves a neoplatonist. Yeah. It was, it's just a modern term. It's a, a lot of terms are like that. We sort of look at history from our modern perspective in yeah. terms, you know, and like the, in the Middle Ages, no one knew they were in the Middle Ages. <laughs> <laughs> and, Byzantines, <laughs> the Byzantines didn't call themselves the Byzantines. They were the Romans still. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And 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 uh, you know when Alexander the Great took over, uh, Alex, uh, you know Egypt and. Established Alexandria, he didn't know it was uh, you know three hundred years before Christ. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so he didn't date it that way. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, the, the idea of of what I see in the Tarot is that um, the Tarot is a creation of the Renaissance. We know historically it was created in the fourteen hundreds in in Renaissance Italy in northern Italy. Uh, the the main cities where it developed were were Ferrara, Bologna, and Milan. And at this time in the Renaissance, the whole name Renaissance, there, there were one era where eventually the people in the Renaissance did know they were in the Renaissance because they named their own era. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I like that. Yeah. And, uh, 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 you know, uh, Vitruvius in, in his uh, The Lives of the Artists uh, used, coined the term. And uh, the thing is, it means rebirth. And what they were trying to do is, is be, uh, you know, they're trying to revive classical culture, classical art and philosophy. So there's a revival of Platonism in the Renaissance, um, but not the, the logical Renaissance of the, the you know modern German philosophers. It's the, uh, the the mystical idea, like they didn't distinguish between Plotinus and Plato and yeah. all these and Pythagoras and all these people. They saw that it was all continuum, and uh, so. The, uh, so the, the Tarot is, is a child, a creation of this period, and it embodies in the Trumps the Neoplatonic mystical journey, which, I, which we, in modern terms, we tend to call it the fool's journey because the fool is the wild card, the outsider who takes the journey, and that's who our fool is. Here we see our fool, in, in my deck it's a woman, and she's, her, she's stepping, instead of stepping off a cliff, she's stepping off a little step. And she's lifting her blindfold, just slight, like she's actually cheating. So she's blindfolded, which is ignorance, but she's cheating. She's looking under it. <laughs> <laughs> and you see how she's sort of just turning around, you know, taking some of things, she's going to turn around and take this journey. She's starting to see the right path all of a sudden. Mm. Okay, and then, so the right path. Now, you, there's, see, a lot of people talk about the major arcana, and, and like a, in most of the occult uh, books, they talk about how there's 22 cards in the major arcana, which is, a, again, a modern term. Nobody in the Renaissance would have called these the major arcana. These were the trumps or triumphi in Italian, and what they are is a parade, a hierarchical parade of, tw and eventually oh, it wasn't always the same pattern, but over the 1400s this pattern developed of 21 trumps, and the number 21 is significant because it's three times seven, and three and seven are very important numbers to uh, Neoplatonic mysticism because three describes the three parts of the soul, which we see consistently in Plato's philosophy. He talks about this, that the soul has three parts. There's a soul related to the body called the, the, the soul of appetite, the soul related to the mind called the soul of will, and the soul of reason, which is created, which is more like the soul and the spirit. Yeah. Which is above the, the, the Greek mind. words for the mind is logos, mm -hmm. and then the appetite is um, eros, and then the will is themos. Themos. For, for those who yeah, are we'll be Eros will be first, then themos. Themos actually... 
It's spiritiness. Thebos is the spirit. Yeah, it was, it was the quality that uh, uh, warriors tried to have. It, was, yes. it meant like v vitalness, vitality. Yes. Which is see, so we don't because we don't quite understand when it's translated soul of will. It's not it, it's, so clear. It's hard to, to translate Thebos. But but see what it, it relates more to modern concepts of uh, the. Uh, uh, the you know the different parts of the mind like yeah. there's the lizard brain yeah uh, the, you know reptilian brain the uh, mammalian brain and the neo mammalian brain which is more of the human brain yeah so so the, the, it has to do with uh, basic desires like this has to do with the body uh, desires for uh, food sex comfort you know all these kind of things mm -hmm. this has to do with standing in the community like ha how you uh, achieve greater respect within your community, and this is about seeing, you know, philosophy and seeing a higher purpose to life. Plato, like I, like I was telling the story to you before about, in the Phaedrus is one of the places where he outlines this, and he talks about how in the beginning of time, each person has a soul, and the soul looks like a chariot, and the chariot has three parts. There's a charioteer representing the soul of reason, and there's two horses, this one, a white horse with wings representing the soul of will, and a dark horse with wings representing the soul of appetite. Mm -hmm. And the charioteer has to keep these chariots together. And the charioteer has a bronze chariot. That's why I showed it green in my illustration. Mm -hmm. uh, so the thing is, in the beginning of time, before the world even begins, all the souls are in a great triumphy, a great, a great, <laughs> see the triumphy just like the tarot. And they go up to heaven and they're, and they're all following Zeus and all the gods are following Zeus. And Zeus has a chariot, but his chariot's golden and has beautiful white horses and all the gods have these beautiful white immortal horses. And, yeah. Yeah. But the humans have the, this, this combination chariot, this three-part chariot. And, uh, and they go up to heaven, but that's not good enough. He takes them up to the heaven above heaven, which is that's something like, it's so mystical. You know, it's like we go to heaven, then we go to the heaven above heaven, yeah. where we see the true essence of virtue. See, because virtue, we think of virtue as an action, but see, what Plato was saying, that beyond the actions, there's an archetype of virtue that's the essence of virtue. Virtue is, is a thing, it's a substance. In fact, he says it's the true food of the soul. It's the real nectar and ambrosia of the gods. So in the beginning, once the, once the uh, chariots get there, they go in a circle around the pure light of virtue, and they absorb, and all the souls are like, they can't get enough of this, it's so wonderful. But, the, but the, uh, the dark and light horses on the human chariots fight with each other. You know, it's like stuff like, like, the, like the soul of appetite, saying, okay, I'm getting bored, like, can't we go find some hot chicks, or, you know. <laughs> Like, I don't want a hamburger, you know, like, <laughs> and then, and the soul of will you always bring me down, and I knew it could be great without you yeah. dragging me down, you know, so they fight, and they break their wings, and then, you know, the charioteer's trying to hold them together as best uh, as she can, and, and then the chariot plunges down, and when it plunges down, it goes, it falls from the heavens, and it comes, it comes to the, the cosmos, and the cosmos, uh, to the Greeks, the cosmos was surrounded by these eight spheres, and on the eight spheres, the signs of the zodiac. And, and as the chariot comes through, it'll come through one of the doorways of the zodiac, and it'll go through the seven spheres of the seven planets. See, this is where the seven comes in. Because there's these seven steps down to the earth plane, and each one's ruled by one of the gods of the planets. And each of those gods would imbue the soul with certain qualities, which is why we have these lists of seven virtues and seven vices. Mm -hmm. And then, this is basically what an astrology chart is mapping. Yeah. Okay, then once you get to the, to the moon, which is the lowest sphere, then you come to the sublunar realm, and the soul is in encapsulated in four elements, so it gets a body, and then you, you're born into the world, and you live out your life and die, and then you go up, and you have to be reincarnated, and come back down, and you keep doing this yeah. until you can rebuild your wings on your, on your chariot. And the reason you want to rebuild your wings is because always, even though life can be great, life can be sweet, you always know something's wrong, because like, you're longing for the, you, you have this taste of the food of the soul, and you're always longing for it. So, you, so there's this thing, it's exactly what they say in Buddhism, because like, in Buddhism they often say the first precept is that uh, life is suffering. But if you look at Pali, which is the original uh, language, the word really translates more, it's, it's dukkha, which isn't really suffering, it means like off-center. So see, see, the thing is, although everything's going fine, there's always a longing in us for something that we know there should be something more. Yeah. And so we want to get back to that. So so basically so we've been exiled into the into the world of physical form. We were like the fools being born. And then and then these these three soul levels form a hierarchy where we go from the soul of appetite to the soul of reason to the soul of will and that helps us get back to our goal to the spirit to be spiritualized, right? And then each of them 
in the in the Torah we see we have seven steps, like the seven plans. So those so those numbers three and seven are very important in Neoplatonic mysticism, and that's the numbers we see in the Torah. So if we look at the first seven cards, we start with the magician, who in the you know in the earliest cards you see that the magician, like in the Marseille deck, isn't a ceremony magician. He's like a street hustler. He's the kind of person that tricks you like a con man. Yeah. He's definitely greedy. Definitely controlled by the soul of will. And then we have four uh, rulers, which aren't, and it's not an accident that there's four of them. Four represent the physical world, like the four elements. And these are these can, can be related to the four elements, the four directions, the four seasons, but they also form a hierarchy. They, they're called the temporal rulers, like lots of times they would call them the four papi, because they're all, like, they're ruled by the Pope. So we have the papis, the empress, the emperor, the pope. Now in different orders in Italy, they, these these four are always together, the Pope's always the top, but they could switch, you know, maybe the Papas would be next to the Pope and, and the Emperor, you know, be Empress, Emperor, Papas, Pope, or, you know, there's, there's different ways to put them together, but the Pope's always top dog. But all of them are trumped by Cupid, who is, in the Renaissance, Cupid is the embodiment of the soul of appetite. He's appetite itself. Mm -hmm. he, he makes you desire things. But then, see, in the end, the seventh card is the chariot, with the, which is this, the the uh, soul of uh, will taking over from, from the soul of appetite. So the chariot's moving us to the next level. It's like, you know, because like if you look at the Marseille deck, you'll see how the, the lover is trying to make a choice. He's trying to make a choice between a virtuous woman with the laurel wreaths like we have here, and the one with flowers in her hair who represents sensuality. Now, according to keep it going, he has to choose the woman with the, with the laurel wreaths. And then he becomes like the charioteer, the hero. He moves into the soul of will. He makes a willful act. Okay, that brings him now to the, where he's going to develop the virtues. Now, there, there's four cardinal virtues, but to understand... See, this is one of the keys that helped me unlock the whole thing. Because in the Tarot, it explicitly illustrates three cardinal virtues. There's justice, strength, and temperance. These three were related to the, to the three soul levels. But not in, the, in, in Plato's... Prudence would have been here instead of uh, justice, but see what the Stoics picked up on Plato's philosophy and they liked it. But then, but they felt that prudence uh, to them was like Mother Nature. She was like the soul of the world, like Anima Mundi. So the thing is, they wanted to change the order. So they said, okay, there's these, these three soul levels, and then you get to the fourth, which is the culmination of all of them. Which instead of being justice, like it would be like you know in. Uh, in Plato's Republic, the whole point is it gets to justice, which is this, it's a definition of justice. Mm -hmm. But here they made prudence the top, and they made justice where prudence would have been. And see, and that's this, the ver that's the order of the virtues that came into the Renaissance and to the Tarot. So that's what we see here. Mm -hmm. So now you see we have okay, and again they're in reverse Platonic order because temperance should be the one that balances the soul of of appetite, strength balances the soul of will, and uh, justice should balance the soul of reason, and then that leads us to the world card, which is really prudence. You see how it's clearly labeled prudence here. Okay, so we're developing those three virtues in here by going into the soul will and taking on the hardships of life. We have this, the sage who becomes an ascetic. He looks at the wheel of fortune, which is how time changes things. He goes through suffering, which is the hangman, and then faces death. This is the hero's journey. Yeah. Okay, so once we get through this, we can come to the next level where we develop the soul of reason. So the very first card, now it might be confusing, because the very first card you see in the soul of reason is the devil, who's the master of unreason. Yeah. But you have to, un see, the devil does us the favor of unmasking the parts of us that are unreasonable. And see, what's, what I'm showing in here, is see how, like, this, this has a little annotation, like we see we have the man representing will and the woman representing appetite here, and that they're both enslaved to the devil, and like, traditionally there'd be chains on them, but there's no chains. They're enslaved to the devil because they're unconscious. Mm. They're asleep. And his power is that we don't know about him. So by bringing him to consciousness is the beginning of working into the soul of reason and working to be uh, to spiritualize ourselves. In other words, you need a consciousness reason. Yeah. Okay, so the first thing is the ego, uh, you know, there's, there's an enlightenment. There's a, like a, a shattering of our illusions, which the ego is sort of displaced, which is the tower being struck, the proud tower. See, they would call this yeah. pride being struck down, which is yeah. like, you know, like the story of the Tower of Babel. Yeah. Right, okay, it's pride being struck down. Then we have this idea of the journey up, and clearly, 
On the star card in the Marseille deck, you see there's seven stars representing the seven planets leading up to the eighth star, which has eight points, and it's, you know, the, the eighth sphere. Okay, so this shows us that whole Neoplatonic structure right in the card. And it shows we're going on this journey, we go back. And so mystics would do the same thing. In the ancient world, like we were talking about before, about the Jewish mystics, uh, you know, contemplating the chariot of God, and how they would, you know, try to go, see the chariot go up through the planets. Well, this is a basic Neoplatonic meditation that all Neoplatonic mystics would do in the ancient world. They visualize, they said, okay, well, if we came down through the seven planets, as Plato described, we can visualize ourselves climbing up, but if we got past the eighth sphere, we could see the heavens and see the glory of heavens again while we're still alive. And maybe then we'd wake up. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we have a vision of that. So this is what this card's about. Now, even though two of the planets, you know, the Earth wasn't a planet to them, it was in the center. Yeah. So the planets were Moon, uh, Mercury, Moon, Mercury, Moon, Mars, Venus, Venus Moon, Mars, oh. Venus, Sun, uh, uh, Jupiter, and Saturn. Okay. So the thing is, because uh, that's. You know, I mean, they're all different orders, but the thing that became a sort of standardized order based on the, the speed of the, of the planets. Yeah. Okay. Now, the sun and moon are actually in there, see, because they're planets. They're not, you, we, you know, they didn't think the planets went around the sun. They yeah, they went planet, around the Earth. planet is a Greek word for anybody that moved in the sky. Yeah, like, you know, so if you went out and you looked at them moving, that's Anything what it looked that like. Moved but the, the thing is, the sun and moon are these ultimate, you know, it's like light and then more light and then the feminine and the masculine. So they're this basic polarity of the feminine and masculine having to come together. And that's what we see here. You see how I have the, the moon, which is represented by the mermaid, coming out of the depths of the ocean, yeah. and then the mermaid comes and meets the sun, who's Apollo, and I call it the hieros mm -hmm. okay. Holy marriage. Yes. Thanks for translating the Greek. Okay, and then, and then what was dead is reborn. Mm -hmm. <laughs> then we, we have judgment. And that brings us to the Anima Mundi, who is also Prudence, who is also Sophia, yeah. who is the wisdom of God. And, then, and she's, she's like, see, she's... The thing, the culmination of the of the of the virtues. Like, so we have the symbols of the of the four virtues here. So even though her, her this is the symbol of prudence, but she is the culmination of them all. But then she's yeah. the as Sophia, she's the mother of the cre three Christian virtues: faith, hope, and charity. And that's the sevenfold mission. Because now, what that does, see, in our bodies we echo these seven soul centers of the planets, and what the virt the seven virtues are supposed to do is purify the seven soul centers and make our energy go up and join to the cosmos. That is deeply profound. Thank you. And I'm, I'm very impressed and amazed at how it just flows so perfectly. With the tarot, naturally, it seems that the Age of Arcana already has that blueprint in it. You just, what, what you were able to do is really bring it out and make it explicit. When before it was more implicit, mm -hmm. you know, this is explicit. Like, this is, this is the Neoplatonism that is in... The writer weight, for example, do you think the writer weight has it built in there? I, I think it's in there. I think that the thing is that they have some other extraneous ideas worked into it. Yeah. But, but they're not they're not disharmonious with the yeah. whole basic thing. But you really make it clear, mm -hmm. clear as day. Yeah. So see, and what I did in the alchemical tarot is this: it, it was showing how the cards related to the great, the, you know, the Charles work with the great work of alchemy, which is basically the same message. Yeah. It's universal. Right. All right. Thank you so much for sharing this with me, and I hope everyone enjoyed. And if anyone has any questions or comments, leave it in the uh, question uh, comment section below. Thank you. Okay. Bye.